Hello, Snake. It's been a while, hasn't it? I hear you've been causing quite the ruckus in Nicaragua. Nothing much to report from my end. The legacies being put to good use. Or so they tell me. But enough with the small talk. There's something I need to tell you. You saw the photo that came with this tape, right? The boss gave that to me. Ten years ago. <sighs> I'm sorry, I should have told you sooner. I probably should have told you right away. But sending it to you hasn't been an easy decision to make. It's taken me ten years. Once you've heard what I have to say, you'll understand why. That photo belonged to her. I know what you're thinking. What does she have to do with this? You've probably seen it a hundred times in the press already. Obviously, it's of the Mercury 7, the first group of American astronauts, the heroes of Project Mercury. But there were actually eight people in that photo. One of them was edited out, erased, without a trace. That eighth astronaut, the one airbrushed out of existence, that was her, the snake. Now why did they need to keep her existence a secret? What were they trying to hide? The answer goes back even further. 17 years ago. It was the height of the Cold War. The Eastern and Western blocs were racing to develop space technology to match their nuclear arsenals. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. The Americans were stunned. They'd been led to believe their country led the world in science and technology. That shock quickly turned into fear. If the Russians had the know-how to launch a satellite into space, they could use it to launch a nuclear missile, too. Frantic, the U.S. threw everything it had into the space race. The following year, the Army succeeded in launching the first American satellite, Explorer 1. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration was established that fall, and Project Mercury with it. The goal was to send a man into space, Seven men were chosen as pilot candidates. The media dubbed them the Mercury Seven. They were immediately hailed as national heroes, icons of Western space exploration. But after Explorer, America suffered a series of failed rocket launches. Desperate, the government made a fateful decision. Unable to wait for its space program to mature, they'd steal the Soviets' technology at the same time sabotaging their space program. You know better than anyone how hard a mission that was. The Soviet space program was shrouded in secrecy. Recovering that information would be no easy task. Using the help of an insider, they'd insert a sleeper agent into the research institute, or else recruit one of those insiders to do the job for them. And if necessary, the mission leader would have to go in and sort things out themselves. Someone was needed with experience, knowledge, and superior intuition. And the only one for the job was the boss. The president himself asked for her by name. He needed someone who could be trusted with the fate of a nation. Who else to turn to but the hero of the Second World War? It was June 1959, so you see, Snake, that's why she left. That was the top secret mission that took her from you. But her selection ruffled a few CIA feathers. They didn't appreciate the president going over their head like that. The mission was tough enough already, and now the CIA was dragging its feet. She couldn't get anything out of them. No manpower, no information. Left to her own devices. The boss made a decision she knew would come back to haunt her. She decided to tap into the Philosopher's Network. And that's when the wheels of fate began to turn. The Philosophers were a secret society of power brokers formed in a pact between the US, Russia, and China in the early 20th century. Of course, by that time, the American and Soviet branches had already parted ways. 
But there were those among the remaining Russian philosophers not entirely happy with the one-party communist state. The boss reached out to them. She arranged clandestine meetings in Berlin, hoping to find a way into OKB-1, the Soviet's premier design bureau. She worked tirelessly to win their sympathy, in some instances using huge sums of cash, in others by helping them over the Berlin Wall. It was a dangerous game to be playing. The philosophers had everything on her, and not just information either. She'd given birth to a child on the battlefield, only to have them immediately snatch it away. I know she told you that story. If that child was in the hands of the Soviet philosophers, she'd be putting more than just herself in danger. But she did what she had to do. At the time, the Soviet Union was believed to have an arsenal of missiles far greater than that of the United States. If that proved to be the case, Moscow would be free from the yoke of nuclear deterrence, raising the possibility that the Soviets might actually launch nukes if they felt it necessary. As you know, the so-called missile gap turned out to be a Soviet bluff. Moscow had gone to incredible lengths to perpetuate the lie. In fact, the whole space race was really just a part of an elaborate ruse. Only we didn't know that at the time. She used to joke that even she swallowed the whole missile gap story, hook, line, and sinker. She put her life on the line, for the sake of her country, to prevent nuclear war. And it was because of her sacrificial efforts that America succeeded in placing a sleeper agent inside OKB-1. NASA began to receive huge volumes of technical data from the Soviet program. By the end of 1959, they'd succeeded in sending a chimpanzee named Sam on a ballistic rocket flight. The rocket never left the atmosphere. But all the same, it was a huge success for NASA, restoring confidence in its technology. Then, just when the operation was starting to produce results, the CIA came calling. You're a war hero, they said. No need for you to dirty your hands with this sort of black ops. We'll take it from here. In effect, they wanted to reap the rewards for themselves. But the boss didn't object. My part is over, she said. I don't care what you do with the data now. It seemed as if NASA was making great strides toward manned spaceflight while the Russians lagged behind. They even got a report from their mole at OKB-1. The safe return of Sam has sent our scientists into a panic, he said. Soon afterward, the Soviet Union sent an animal of its own into space on Sputnik 2. The dog Kudryavka, better known to the world as Laika. But Laika was fated never to return to Earth. The U.S. can recover its spacecraft from the ocean upon re-entry. But the Soviet Union only borders the frozen Arctic. They had to bring their spacecraft down on land. How could they soften the impact enough to bring a living creature back safely? The agent reported that the Soviets hadn't yet found a solution to that problem. The plot to sabotage the Soviet space program seemed to be working, too. First, they tampered with Sputnik 4's re-entry. Then, two months later, one of their rockets exploded on the launch pad. They did manage to send two dogs into orbit aboard Sputnik 5 and return them safely to Earth. But the agent dismissed it as a fluke. Dogs, sure, but humans? They didn't have the technology. Everybody believed it. Everybody was complacent. Everybody. Except the boss. There was something about the Sputnik 5 schematics they were getting that didn't seem right. Some kind of ejection device on the capsule that didn't quite belong. She couldn't figure out the reason why it was there. What was it supposed to eject? NASA shrugged off her concerns. They figured it was probably meant to eject the flight recorder in case of an accident. The boss pleaded with them to investigate, but the CIA wasn't having it. They probably thought she was trying to reclaim some of the glory for herself. The boss wouldn't give up. She decided
decided to head to the soviet union herself alone without any backing from the cia by the beginning of the next year one thousand nine hundred sixty one she succeeded in infiltrating o k b one that's when she saw the truth for the first time the sleeper that she'd worked so hard to place was a double agent He'd been turned by the Soviets and was feeding the Americans lies. But what shocked the boss even more was why. The CIA's access agent had been taking a large cut of the sleeper's pay. The sleeper felt what little he was left with wasn't worth the risk. When he got a better offer from Moscow, he took it. At some point, the Americans' intelligence operation had become an open book to the Soviets. And contrary to what the sleeper had been reporting, the Soviets' manned spaceflight technology was quite advanced. It wasn't until she infiltrated OKB-1 herself that the boss learned the truth about Sputnik 5. After the spacecraft re-entered the atmosphere, it ejected the pilot, seat and all, at an altitude of 7,000 meters. It was the Soviet solution to the problem of land recovery. The mystery device attached to Sputnik 5 was for that purpose. The pilot would parachute down from that high altitude wearing a bulky spacesuit. <laughs> Crazy, I know. The Soviets knew exactly how dangerous it was, of course. So much so that they gave Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, a special two-rank promotion before re-entry. Only Moscow could come up with this kind of plan. With total state control over information, they could easily pretend it never happened in the event of a failure. The boss passed the info on to NASA. It was their worst nightmare. The glory of mankind's first space flight was about to be stolen from them by the Soviet Union. It was Sputnik all over again. And the CIA was caught no less off guard. Their ineptitude had caused the fiasco in the first place. The Soviets' deception was brilliant. They'd woven a masterful tapestry of truth and fiction to convince the Americans their intelligence operations were proceeding as planned. No one but the boss could have seen through it. It was obvious the Soviets had some gifted minds working on their side. But that certainly didn't excuse the CIA's massive failure. The CIA wasn't done, though and devised an ingenious plan to avoid taking responsibility. Luckily for them, a new president had been elected the previous November, John F. Kennedy. As he didn't know the case history when taking office, the CIA was able to feed lies to his new administration. They masked their own failures, placing the blame squarely on the boss's shoulders. After all, she'd selected an unreliable sleeper they claimed she'd failed to make use of one of the most effective means of controlling a sleeper agent's actions, holding their family hostage. The boss was well aware that would have worked. She told me so later, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. It seems clear it had to do with having her own child taken. She could never inflict the same pain on anyone else. The CIA used that against her. In his election campaign, Kennedy had vowed to close the missile gap with Moscow. If America lost the space race, that promise would be worthless. The fact that the president had no links to the philosophers only made things worse. He was completely unaware of the secret networks she'd used to complete her mission. In his eyes, she was no better than a traitor. The fate that awaited her was cruel beyond belief. The order came down from above. The boss would take the official blame for the sleeper's betrayal. More so, she'd serve as the guinea pig for NASA's manned spaceflight program. By then, NASA had gotten as far as sending a chimp named Ham into space. Now came a whole battery of ground tests to pave the way for a human to take its place. 
High G tests, zero G tests, spacesuit tests, simulations and pressurized oxygen environments. Some of the tests were highly dangerous, too dangerous for the Mercury 7, who were by then already media darlings. So the boss was made to stand in for them. She could have refused the order, argued her side of the story against the CIA, but she didn't. The way she saw it, her military experience made her a potentially valuable asset to those tests. She felt it was her duty to accept. She soon proved herself right. The boss was more than just a guinea pig. She drew on her experience to give the staff focused advice exactly where it was needed. NASA's space program took off again. At the rate they were going, Putting a man in space seemed within reach. The higher-ups at NASA were impressed with her talents. They took to calling her the eighth astronaut, the Mercury Lady. The photo I sent you was taken around that time. I suppose maybe they were planning to use it as propaganda, the world's first female astronaut. But then, just as things were looking up, they hit a new snag. The government told them to add a window. There were no windows in NASA spacecraft back then. Ham never saw the stars around him. But Washington insisted. Their sources told them Soviet spaceships had windows. Space exploration as a form of propaganda in itself. After all, what was the point of sending a man into space if he couldn't tell the world what he'd seen? Most of all, though, they simply couldn't have the Russians doing something they couldn't. It was sheer madness, and everybody knew it. NASA was already facing impossible deadlines. Now they were adding yet another element of uncertainty to the mix. Installing a window would both weaken the spacecraft and make it harder to shield the occupant from cosmic rays. They weren't about to put their Mercury 7 golden boys in that kind of danger. So the boss was chosen as the pilot instead. Even if she made it up into space, she was given less than a 20% chance of returning to Earth alive. But she took it in stride, even helping them make the necessary design changes to the Mercury capsule. It was like going to work every day at NASA to make her own coffin. Then, without warning, the U.S. received intelligence that the Soviets had moved their Vostok spacecraft to the launch site. The launch was set for the following day, April 12th, 1961. America couldn't let the Soviets beat them with Vostok. NASA was forced to cut short the testing process and move the launch date up. They pulled out all the stops to get it scheduled for the earliest hours of the next day. The spacecraft would be launched from Cape Canaveral in the dead of night. For the flight path, they chose a course that would take her as far east as possible. She'd be able to see the Earth in daylight from the window, at least for a little while. The boss climbed into the Mercury capsule, having completed less than 80% of the regular flight procedures. Both the timing and the flight path were risky, and testing was far from complete. But NASA had no other choice. The boss, for her part, never expected to come home alive. She was going on a one-way trip, the American version of Laika the dog. And yet she went all the same. Someone has to be first, she said. If fate has chosen me, then I accept for my country, for the balance of the world. That's how she saw things. My chances may be slim, but I'll take them. I've accepted my fate. If anyone can get through this, I can. Then, on April 12th at 1.30 in the morning, the boss entered space. It was nothing short of a miracle. First, that she'd made it in an incomplete spacecraft. And second, that her flight coincided almost exactly with Gagarin's. As the sun rose over the horizon and cosmic rays began to bombard her through the window, she saw the Earth, 
I think you've heard the story before. It was a world without borders, a perfect jewel. All nations, all ideologies. They seem so far away. <laughs> it almost made her laugh, knowing that they'd risked so much to beat the Soviets by a few short minutes. If she'd seen Vostok from her window, she probably would have waved. But the two spacecraft were destined for very different fates. Gagarin circled the Earth and returned to the Soviet Union, safe and sound. The Mercury capsule, on the other hand, deviated from its planned re-entry angle. The addition of a window had thrown the capsule's aerodynamics off balance. The boss's coffin veered wildly off course and began to plunge earthward. The course deviation caused the capsule to miss its splashdown point by a wide margin. It didn't have enough time to decelerate before crashing into the sea. The force of the impact shattered the spacecraft before it started to sink like a stone. The boss used the last of her strength to escape to the surface. Her body was covered in bruises and scorched by radiation. It was a miracle she was still alive. She slipped into a coma and didn't regain consciousness for six months. To some, what was worst of all was that she had lost the space race to Gagarin by only a few minutes. That aside, it should have been a proud day for America. Its first manned space flight. Sadly, her accomplishment was kept out of the history books. An attempt to save face by Washington. In contrast to Gagarin's orbital flight, America had only managed a ballistic trajectory. Her flight time was much shorter, too. And most importantly, the Soviets had brought back both spacecraft and pilot safely. NASA couldn't even conjure up a half-hearted tale of heroic survival. The coup de grace, though, was the Soviet propaganda campaign that kicked into gear after the flight. The Earth was blue. Those were the words of Gagarin on his return, and the whole world was listening. In the blink of an eye, Gagarin was an international celebrity earning accolades from every corner. It was a PR coup for the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, Washington could only grit its teeth in silence. They decided there was no value in making the boss's flight public, that it would only make matters worse. So they buried it instead, labeling it a dark mission. NASA and the CIA did everything in their power to erase all traces of the boss from Project Mercury. <laughs> the result was the photo you see before you. Not a bad job, huh? Not only did they expunge her flight from the records, they denied that she ever existed. And that wasn't the end of it. As an alibi, the military claimed she'd taken part in the CIA's botched Bay of Pigs plot to take back Cuba. And when the boss was finally well enough to return to service, they wouldn't take her back. She was forced to go underground. In the public eye, the boss was still a hero of World War II. In reality, though, she was anything but that. She was a non-person, fit only for the blackest of black ops. In effect, she may as well have been dead. Gagarin went on a worldwide tour in front of millions of adoring fans. The boss, meanwhile, was a walking secret, unable to breathe a word about her experience. The authorities in Washington had this to say. Why are you still here? <laughs> if only you'd had the decency to give us a nice quote like Agarin and then die an honorable death, you'd have gone down as a hero. Three weeks later on May 5th, Alan Shepard, one of the Mercury 7, made his own ballistic flight. They sure didn't try to cover up his achievement. Of course, he owed his success to the lessons learned from the boss's tragedy. Before sending Gagarin up into space, the Soviets had used a mannequin called Ivan Ivanovich to test the landing procedure, which would make the boss America's version 
of a crash test dummy. But she didn't care. I'm happy to be the dummy, she said. If it'll help the project succeed, nothing would give me greater satisfaction. And that still wasn't the end of it. The boss had worked through the anti-Moscow faction of the Soviet Union's philosophers to place the sleeper agent. And at some point, the Soviets found out about it. Yet the Americans remained oblivious to the end. Even the philosopher network the boss plugged into never tipped them off to the double cross. That could only mean one of two things. Either the pro-Moscow philosophers had intervened, or the anti-Moscow philosophers had been turned. Either way, it was a situation their American counterparts couldn't stand. To preserve the philosopher's good name, and to repay her debt, so to speak, the boss once again made her way into the Soviet Union. There, she found herself face to face with the Soviet's own agent. And who should she find awaiting her return to Russia? The one who turned her sleeper against her. Who'd fed them lies all this time. It was her former comrade in arms. The father of her child. The man known as the Sorrow. He didn't know it was the boss who'd sent the sleeper. Or to be more precise, the Soviet philosophers never told him. Former lovers, forced to fight to the death. One would live and one would die, she told me. That was the revenge the Soviet philosophers had in store for me. If both of them survived, their child would suffer in their place. They were left with no other option. The boss shot him. He offered no resistance. When she returned from the Soviet Union, there was no place left for her to go. She'd sacrificed everything. Everything. For her country. And in return, they treated her like a dead woman. She was made a scapegoat for no good reason. Only because power had changed hands in Washington. Any lesser being would have long since cracked. It was then that one of her old SAS comrades reached out to her, Major Zero, and so Fox was born. She undertook a mission that, well, you should know better than anybody. You are a part of it. 20 days after Shepard's flight, President Kennedy announced that America would put a man on the moon. Without the intelligence the boss obtained, America's space program would never have caught up. Armstrong and Aldrin might never have walked on the moon, but the Americans' gain had cost the boss her health, her honor, and the man she loved. The word tragedy doesn't even begin to describe what she endured. The Soviets continued their manned space flights, and in 1963, Valentina Tereshkova became the so-called first woman in space. It's said they took their cue from NASA's long-buried Mercury Lady project. And so that, Snake, is the mission that kept her away from you for so long. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why not use me as her agent? She knew I'd never even think of betraying her. I think it's because she didn't want to drag you into it. She probably knew what was going to happen. To complete the mission, she'd have to turn to the philosophers. And once she did that, whatever came of it, there'd be a price to pay. No one understood that better than her. So please, Snake, let it go. When she gave me the photo, she left me to decide whether or not to pass it along to you. I know she was torn about it, just as I was. She knew you'd probably blame yourself. Why did 
that you hold on to it for so long that I, I can't say. To remind her of how much it hurt to be erased. She wasn't that kind of person. No. I think she meant it to be a message to you. She had her identity, her life, taken away. But she wanted you, of all people, to know the truth. Snake, you've probably already figured this out, but it's no accident that I'm only now sending you something I've withheld for so long. The little bird tells me you recently made a big decision. You and the boss are different people. I understand that. And I'm not trying to second guess you. I I simply wanted you to know what she saw, how she felt. That's all. Keep it with you, Snake. Keep it deep inside. Don't ever forget the path she took. Because you and I are the only people on this earth who know the truth.